It is a different world today from what it was then. It will be a different world tomorrow from what it is today. Ram Watangu. Welcome to Warfare Advancement and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone for listening so far. Uh, this week we'll be moving into Oceania and talking about the native and ab aboriginal peoples who lived there at around 10,000 BC. Uh, this will also include parts of Southeast Asia that I left out in an earlier episode. Places like uh, the tip of the Malay Peninsula or the Peninsular Malay, however you want to divide that up. And the islands of Borneo, Java, Sulawesi, and Sumatra. Um, the reason I did this is because up to this point in time, there was probably a closer ethnic and cultural relationship between these peoples and the peoples in Oceania at 10,000 BC. But before we get into that, I do want to kind of go over a little bit of feedback um, that I've had from the last couple of episodes. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has given some feedback. Um, first, I had some questions about um, if I was going to get back into doing more kind of religious breakdowns of peoples. And yes, I will. Um, I know I did that kind of in depth for the Koi and the San, and some possible, you know, possible religious traditions for people living in the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa along the West Coast. The reason I haven't gone into too much detail outside of Africa and that kind of thing is um, we really don't have firm oral traditions that we can guarantee are from this time period. I'm sure that, you know, proto-traditions or, like, some basis for later myths are from this time, maybe even a little bit earlier. But there's no way to really guarantee and lock that down. And I kind of want to take things as they come. Um, for the next section, you know, when we do our next time jump uh, to about 8000 BC, I'm going to go into a little bit more details for people kind of living out side of Africa. So please look forward to that discussion when we get there. Um, now for specifically Oceania, there are some groups that we might be able to talk about that kind of thing with, specifically the Aboriginal people living in Australia. However, I am not going to be going over that this week. And there's a, there's a big reason why, and I'll get into it later. But these people do have a very old religious tradition, and, you know, we do have kind of records of that, you know, prior to, you know, or at least um, near contemporary, uh, contemporaneous interactions with them and Europeans, you know. So their legends are a little bit more uh, easy to find, at least um, once Europeans arrived, their original unaltered, I guess, uh, mythologies and religious practices and we will get into that later and again I'll kind of go into detail while I'm not gonna dive too deep in that this episode <clears throat> uh, the other bit of feedback I have uh, came in relation to um, people had asked if I was um, going to go into detail um, into some other animal domestication um, like I did to the horses. Yes, I will be doing that. Um, that's going to be kind of a big deal in the next set of episodes. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, yeah, I, I haven't really gotten into that too much just yet. Uh, but that's going to be a big factor in, t um, in the next time period that we jump to. Um, also, another thing is uh, I have uploaded the podcast to some more um, websites, some more feeds, uh, things like Stitcher is the main one. Uh, and I've already got some downloads there and I hope to hear back from new listeners there, you know, coming up. Um, so please, uh, feel free to reach out if you're an old listener or if you prefer one of those other platforms, please check me out there. You might be able to find me at a better location for you at least. Um, <clears throat> but that's not a change where it's been uploading on Google Podcasts or RSS or Spotify. So that's uh, that's kind of the housekeeping stuff. So let's go ahead and continue on. 
So uh, at 10,000 BCE, at this point in the Holocene period, um, you know, this has, you know, warmer temperatures had led to higher and higher sea levels around all of these islands. Um, prior to this time frame, uh, Borneo, Java, and Sumatra were all connected by, by at least some extent to each other and to Southeast Asia, uh, where that Malay Peninsula juts out. And then you have those big islands, Java, Sumatra, and Borneo. They were all together. And uh, these were, sometimes you'll see these referred to as a couple of different things. Um, uh, these are sometimes referred to as Sunda or Sundaland. And uh, now Sulawesi was still an island. And what Sulawesi is, you probably have seen it on a map. It's kind of that full, that kind of curved or crooked X shape island, um, kind of dividing Borneo from, say, the Philippines or uh, Papua New Guinea, that that kind of thing. Um, so that is still kind of a big island that separates Sundaland from. Um, Australia and the other parts or islands of Oceania. And in fact, at, even at this late date, it is possible that Australia was still connected to New Guinea in the north and Tasmania in the south uh, by some amount of land. Probably not a full land bridge, you know, the way it had been earlier. Um, I've read a couple of different sources and they've all either given the time frame as of now or even as late as 8000 BCE as when these land routes closed. Now whatever the exact case of that is once these water levels ro rose to the modern um, kind of the modern levels any travel that kind of existed between these regions was probably massively curtailed until later periods. Now, of course, the standard explanation that the peoples of these areas are living uh, that, well, I should say, this is kind of my standard explanation that I give for, that I have given for everyone else we've talked about up to this point, uh, that these people uh, in these areas are living basically the same type of lifestyle as every other human in the world. They were hunter-gatherers. But what makes this region especially interesting and it, that it is home to the earliest evidence of Homo sapien habitation and culture outside of Africa and the very close uh, Middle East or East Asia, or I'm sorry, Southwest Asia. <laughs> In fact, Sahul, um, which is the kind of the name for the, the continent of Australia and New Guinea when they were, you know, where they were not divided by the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, when they were one big landmass just divided from Sundaland by Sulawesi and the river and the oceans between them, um, that's the name that you can refer to this kind of supercontinent as. Uh, Sahul so, so was basically rapidly inhabited once we left Africa. Um, we have evidence of permanent Homo sapiens living there before even Europe, uh, despite, you know, despite Europe being much closer to Africa than Sahul. Uh, we also have the oldest Homo sapien rock art and drawings outside of Africa in Sulawesi. So uh, the probable oldest uh, modern Homo sapien remains outside of Africa can also be found in Australia. Um, now, of course, there is always the possibility that these have been misdated or that you know, evidence showing a different date range just didn't survive. But that being said, the climate of India, Sunda, and Sahul was probably much closer to what Homo sapiens were used to living in uh, Africa than, say, like the colder climate of Europe or the Eurasian steppe. Uh, there's also the factor that I think played into this path of migration being more, you know, being more suitable not just the climate. Uh, this part of the world was lacking in competing species of, um, of Homo, uh, of other Homo species. Um, Homo erectus had died out about 50,000 years before, you know, we started to move into the region. 
and while there were definitely branches of Denosovans in the region, and probably some other types of archaic remnants that we haven't discovered or we just have very little evidence of, things like, say, uh, Homo florensis or the hobbits, um, they were probably not nearly as numerous as the Neanderthals in the north. And they didn't have an answer to the incoming Homo sapiens weapons, ranged weapons, and they didn't have the numbers advantage that Neanderthals did initially. It's also possible that they possible that they weren't quite as um, intelligent as Neanderthals were, or as us. So, um, not that that you know that at least that's my theory. Um, I think it's probably a good one. But you know, if you disagree, please let me know. Um, and it's not to say that you know the human weapon or Homo sapien weapons were directed at these other uh, you know. Homo, sap or homo subspecies. Uh, it may have been, uh, but it's also possible that it just allowed them to easily outcompete uh, the other uh, homo subspecies living in the region. Now, the humans that moved into this area uh, continued to develop the tools that they brought with them uh, and innovated their own you know, skills and culture. Uh, we already talked about how there have been caches of uh, microliths, bladelets, things like that found like in Sri Lanka uh, as an example. So, you know, that's around the same time period that this migration is happening. So, you know, the, you know they probably have, um, you know, at least some form of spear or throwing dart. Another uh, tool that they brought with them uh, and kind of developed on their own um, and it's one that most people probably think of when they think of, uh, you know, indigenous Australians, um, is the boomerang. And contrary to popular belief, these were not invented in Australia. Uh, you can find them all over the world in a lot of different cultures. And despite the popular view of these items, boomerangs do not have to return to the thrower. And many traditional boomerangs do not return. Um, it would be, you know, fair to say that, you know, they were, you know, um, that they remained very popular in Australia for a very long time, though. So this is something that it seems like the peoples in Australia were probably very good at using. Sorry for the rough cut there. I had a alarm going off in our parking lot. Uh, so yes, uh, Aboriginal hunters in Australia were very good with using. Uh, the boomerang, and they also have their own kind of uh, dart thrower, um, an atlatl, as I referred to it as earlier. earlier. Uh, I think uh, the term that I've seen used the most is uh, woomera, which comes from a language um, from one of the Aboriginal peoples that live in kind of South Australia, the uh, the Aora. Um, but essentially, it's a you know, it's it's basically a very heavy. Uh, throwing kind of um, counterbalance. It's, it's basically they use stones to help it enhance their, their spear throwing abilities. Um, one thing though that we're not sure about is, um, and this kind of plays into why I'm not talking about Aboriginal um, religious practices at this point in time. Um, there is not evidence of bows and arrows uh, in Australia, and we're not really sure why. It could be that they had no need for them, that the, their boomerangs, their spears, spear throwers were more than sufficient to allow these people to hunt, um, you know, whatever they needed in Australia. So they didn't really need long range. It's also possible that the type of bows and arrows that were in use at the time uh, just didn't survive just due to the reason. They could be something made from very simple pieces of wood. They like not something like, say, a compound bow where you combine two different items or two different kinds of wood to create a stronger bow. Uh, they could have initially had, say, something similar to um, the bows used by the, the San peoples in southern Africa, where it's not very large and it's shooting very small, uh, almost dart tipped 
arrows and you know they may not have had the type of neurotoxin that the San people used uh, in their hunting so they may have just decided this wasn't worth it better use a spear which maybe has less range but more power um, it's it's certainly possible that they had them and then just stopped using them because they didn't need them and then that just fell out of use. In fact, I think later um, certain certain groups of the uh, Aboriginal people living in Australia even stopped using the boomerang. I think it said, um, I believe it was some of the ones in kind of like the more forested areas in I believe it's the north of Australia that they stopped using the boomerang for you know, just because it wouldn't go through trees all that well. Um, you know, it would get caught up a lot. So it's certainly very possible that they had bows and arrows, they just stopped using them, and they fell out of the, the record, and we just have nothing of that. And, um, and it's something that, obviously, they could have reinvented if they needed it, and then lost it again. That kind of thing is not unheard of. Um, We'll talk about that when we get to kind of agriculture in uh, in Egypt. Um, things like uh, sickles fall in and out of use for a few, you know, altering centuries, basically. Um, but that being said, so the reason I'm not going too much into kind of religious traditions of these people living at this time is that a lot of Oceania and Southeast Asia, like the Borneo, Malay, that kind of area, the islands basically of Southeast Asia and Oceania, is that the people who are inhabiting it 10,000 BC are probably going to be replaced or out out produced by a later wave of migrations coming specifically from tai, Taiwan. Um, there will be a numerous waves of people leaving uh, that area and they will go to the various parts of um, Southeast Asia and meet up with the Southeast Asians that had moved into the area, uh, form their own cultures. They will eventually go to, uh, of course, parts of the Philippines, uh, Sulawesi, uh, New, uh, Papua New Guinea, and of course Australia itself. Um, and Oceania can kind of be divided into a few different regions. Um, Micronesia, um, Australia, you know, and there's overlap between all these various regions. Um, now that's not to say that they moved in and wiped out the people living there before. Um, there's not a huge amount of, like, e genetic evidence, but there is enough to show that at least in Australia's case that, you know, there are definite, um, early strains of other homo sapiens and probably some type of as yet unknown other hominid, you know, probably a branch of Denosovan or maybe a branch of uh, Neanderthal or something like Homo florensis, something like that. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, overlap. There's, there's continuation genetically, if not culturally. So because I'm not too sure of this early culture, um, I, I don't want to go too much into detail. Um, now, I mentioned about the oldest remains of uh, modern Homo sapiens outside of Africa being found in Australia. As far as I can tell, it's an older article, but I haven't seen anything, you know, kind of counter, you know, contradicting that. Um, I know that we talked about how there were some supposed Homo sapien fossils found in Greece that are 100,000 years old. Um, but again, I think there is some debate as to whether those are true modern Homo sapiens, you know, or if those people passed on their genetics. They, you know, they probably all died out there. Um, what is probable is that the remains found in Australia probably were the ancestors of, if you know, if not directly, then at least um, to some extent of the people currently living there. I think uh, you can find information about that find uh, if you look up the um, the Mungo Man is one name. It's a one of three uh, sets of remains that were found and they did some testing on um, from that region. And um, it's very possible that 
uh, you know, that that was an ancestor or a close relative of no ancestor of the people that are currently living there. Uh, more remains from around that time frame have popped up in the region. Uh, they kind of been exposed from the elements kind of blowing through and kind of uh, disturbing the, the ground that these people had been buried in. Um, there have been attempts by scientists to kind of examine those remains and get DNA, but uh, that has been mostly kind of discouraged and refused by the tribes people living in the region. Um, because, you know, they obviously have a very fraught history with, um, out, you know, the, the colonizers from Europe and other regions, uh, now, especially I think India migration, uh, into Australia is kind of a big topic, at least to locally there. So it's, I can understand why they don't want to have, um, you know, people poking around the remains of their ancestors. You know, there's very, you know, there's very real religious and spiritual reasons they don't want people there. Uh, and of course, there there are some political reasons there as well. Uh, I'm sure that they fear that any kind of results that maybe show that they're maybe not as closely related as they believe to those people living there, that that might somehow discredit their claims and rights to the land. I don't think that that would be a very valid argument because even then they were still living there for, oh, you know, 7,000 years or so before Europeans showed up. But I can understand the fear. Uh, and I am, you know, certainly, you know, okay with their religious and spiritual reasons, you know, for, you know, have, not wanting people to like poke and prod your ancestors. So I can understand. I do, I do wish that they would be a little bit more, um, open to the idea of at least allowing for very low-level invasive, you know, if not uh, excavation of the area, at least try to get some material from the bones and then allow them to be properly uh, reinterred by the, the tribal groups. But that's their business. They ultimately have the final say, so what they say goes. I'm not going to, you know, fight or raise a snake about it. Uh, because, again, I do think that they are related. Uh, I think the genetic evidence of uh, just modern-day people, even if you don't have a specific uh, fossil to kind of relate it to, uh, shows that they definitely have very old, uh, unconnected to any other uh, Homo sapien group DNA. So they definitely have you know some level of very primal and ancient claim to the land. So... You know, I, I don't think even if even if it shows that it's not quite as old as they think it is, you know, I don't think it's enough to kind of upset it. So, but again, it's their decision. So, I'm just gonna kind of leave it at that. So, uh, but yes, so Australia, the people living there, probably among the the furthest migrations from Homo sapiens out of Africa, um, and this region's gonna kind of play host to some more waves of migration. Again, I touched on people from Taiwan. Uh, that's going to come in uh, next episodes. That's a major migration point. And these people will have several different episodes that we're going to cover, basically, where they're ending up in the region and outside of the region. Um, so, look forward to that. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's also possible, and I should just want to point this out that on some of these smaller islands that some of these first migrants probably did die out probably not somewhere like Australia or Papua New Guinea um, they you know of course those islands are much larger they have a much greater amount of food and clean water to go with but as the sea levels arise it would not surprise me if you know some groups kind of got cut off from uh, better islands or, you know, ways to get food and probably died off, you know, in small numbers. Uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that definitely happened. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but again, I do think enough survived and passed on their genes and, you know, eventually did kind of end up as part of these groups from um, uh, Taiwan uh, later. 
Uh, yes, also, uh, people in Papua New Guinea that are, you know, have been in Papua New Guinea around the same time frame as the Aboriginals, just to go back to hunting tools, they have bows and arrows. So there's no reason why the they didn't at one point in Australia have this technology. Um, I don't think, you know, that they obviously couldn't have thought of it. It's just one of those things where they probably didn't need it and it just fell out of use. Or it wasn't possibly the material that they were around. They it wasn't it wasn't as easy to make bows the way they knew how to make them from other material. So they're just like it's too much work. It's not worth the hassle. We have enough tools to kind of survive on our own. Um, and I talked about, of course, Sulawesi having uh, a lot of the the oldest cave art outside of Africa. Uh, but of course, there is very very ancient cave art in Australia. Uh, that is probably made, not least of which by the um, later migrants, but by the the group that came in, you know, around fifty to sixty thousand years ago. So, yeah, I think that's kind of the highlights of this episode. Um, so I hope everyone listens and enjoys. A um, little bit longer than I was actually expecting this to one to be. Um, this region is actually going to be. Uh, it's going to be one of the more interesting ones to talk about later. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I know it's a kind of a it's kind of a shame it's a one off now, but honestly, the amount of information I was getting for the region, um, you know, is actually you know from further down the line. So unfortunately, not too much to kind of go over that's concrete. I just kind of wanted to hype uh, uh, hype a hypothetically go over why I think this region was occupied so quickly uh, before other parts. Um, but yeah, so uh, next week we will be moving into Europe, and then after that we will go to North and South America. I think Europe may be one, two episodes, maybe like a, a longer episode like this one, um, or maybe two episodes that are maybe only about 20 so minutes or so. Um, and then, of course, North America, South America. Um, there may be enough for one of one episode for each of those. It might be one episode for both because the people living there, there's not a huge number, but I do think they're spread out enough that they kind of have enough differences between them that I might be able to go into de some detail on. But we'll see. Uh, I'm still kind of scripting some stuff out. Um, but yeah. Um, please, if you have any feedback, do not hesitate to reach out with me either on um, Twitter, which I will include a link in the episode description for you know any kind of uh, direct message that you may want to send. Uh, you can also give me feedback at waradrevpod at gmail.com uh, if you have any questions or feedback there. Um, also, please feel free. I think I have three kind of episodes for October for kind of our... Um, kind of fantasy horror uh special episodes for that month um while i of course kind of do a little bit more in-depth research for the next section of the podcast uh so i do look forward to hearing from some people about that uh but yeah thank you all for listening and i hope you have a great rest of your day goodbye <laughs>